Welcome back, word nerds. Mike here with the social life of language, making complex language and social theory simple but never simplified. If you think that sounds cool, hit that subscribe button now. Today we're covering a chapter by Jonathan Rosa titled From Mock Spanish to Inverted Spanglish, Language Ideologies and the Racialization of Mexican and Puerto Rican Youth in the United States. And it's found in this book, Raciolinguistics. We'll be complicating this thing we call mock Spanish, stuff like ay caramba, adios muchacho. Let's turn to our resident expert on mock Spanish. They were silent, silencio. When we have the laws changed, it'll be like perfecto. We want to make it perfecto. Perfecto, perfecto. These people, are, they've gone crazy. They've gone loco. The Fed is going loco. They've gone loco. Loco. Plus, I'll be giving away Jonathan Rosa's brand new book, Looking like a language, sounding like a race. Oh, it smells like a library. But you gotta watch all the way to the end to figure out how to win your copy. So we've learned from our previous videos that when spoken by white persons, mock Spanish can at times serve to indirectly elevate whiteness while also denigrating Spanish and Spanish speakers. But Rosa addresses the very first question I had about mock Spanish. What happens when Latinx folks use phrases that sound like mock Spanish? What happens when we use phrases like no problemo or cerveza or manana? Is it still mock Spanish? Are we still mocking Spanish speakers? I'll give you my favorite example. So in South Texas, we talk about our mothers hitting us with their chanclas, their sandals. Because we imagine Mexican mothers wearing sandals all the time for some reason. There's even a really good chancla meme selection online right now. You should definitely go check that out. Oh! But when we're talking about chanclas, most of the time it feels like we're poking fun at old people at old Mexican Americans, like our moms, dads, grandpas, grandmas. But this is also an inside joke that acknowledges, yeah, we're both from South Texas, we're both Mexican. And at the same time, this puts some distance between young people and old people. So this chancla joke has implications for how we identify ourselves, identifying ourselves as a different age group or maybe a bit more American. So we see from this example, even though chancla is pronounced through an English phonology as opposed to chancla, it doesn't necessarily have the effect of elevating whiteness or denigrating Spanish and Spanish speakers. It produces a different kind of social action, different kinds of social effects. This is kind of what this article is about. What kind of effects does this kind of mock Spanish, a mock Spanish-ish, have on the world? What happens when Latinx folks use it? So mock Spanish was conceptualized by Jane Hill. Click here for that video. Why don't I ever remember what side it's on? And she said mock Spanish denigrates historically Spanish-speaking populations. However, would a light-skinned Spanish-speaking person from, let's say, Spain be racialized the same way as a dark-skinned Mexican from California? Would a Spaniard be strongly linked to stereotypes that frame them as lazy or uneducated? So Rosa says, hold on a second. It appears that mock Spanish maybe doesn't denigrate all Spanish speakers, but more specifically, mock Spanish helps to racialize Latinx folks in the United States. That's a pretty different assertion from Jane Hill. Plus, it's not safe to assume that Latinx people are somehow unified by the Spanish language. Sometimes it's how we make ourselves different from each other. Maybe speaking better or worse Spanish, speaking Mexican Spanish versus Puerto Rican Spanish. Maybe some Latinx folks don't understand Spanish or maybe some understand but don't speak. Maybe some speak but don't write. Maybe some have English accents on their Spanish. Maybe some use Spanglish. And this is where Rosa says, there is space to rethink this thing we call mock Spanish. In in this chapter, he talks about a particular language practice at this high school that he calls inverted Spanglish. The Spanish language can be used to produce all kinds of different identities. In this high school where Rosa did his research, we got these circulating language beliefs 
about Mexican Spanish being more correct, while Puerto Rican Spanish was perceived as being more cool. So we got a couple ways that students might identify with one another and also apart from one another. But both groups of students would also use phrases that resemble mock Spanish. So we need to look at what kind of social action this performs on the world. On page 73, Rosa says, Mock Spanish involves the production of whiteness through the combination of Spanish linguistic forms and English pronunciation. Inverted Spanglish appropriates similar linguistic patterns to produce U.S. Latino ethnolinguistic identities that signal intimate familiarity with both English and Spanish. So we might ask, what happens when students speak Spanish in English. In excerpt one, he gives us an example of two students trading inverted Spanglish insults. One of the students says, what's up, cabron? And then the other student says, not much, pendejo. So we got all the features of mock Spanish here, but these words are not necessarily included in that list of popular mock Spanish words like no problemo or siesta. So here, these words perform a particular type of social action. First, it highlights a shared Latino identity while putting whiteness at an arm's length. So we're not speaking Spanish and English the exact same way a monolingual white person would. It also lays claim to a cool Americanness while also signaling an English language dexterity. So we can joke in Spanish and English when we want to. Can you do that? No, I don't think you can. Loser. And finally, it displays an insider knowledge of Spanish. We know why it's funny to say the word pendejo. And if you don't know that's a bad word, then you're probably not gonna get it. Loser. So one more example so you can master your inverted Spanglish and be better than everybody else that you know. Oh, that's not the point of the video, Mike. In another example, we see how speaking Spanish and English has totally different effects depending on what body it's actually coming out of. On page 75, we have a Mexican student at a restaurant parodying the white customers when she says, Donde esta el baño? Now there's gonna be very different effects here. So let's use our imagination a bit. If a white person said that to a Spanish speaker, that is going to have very specific effects on the context. On the other hand, if this Mexican student happens to know this Spanish speaking server, in that moment, those two might just have established a connection. So this is part of the inversion of inverted Spanglish. Mock Spanish helps create a white identity. On the other hand, inverted Spanglish can help create a shared Latinx identity. Plus it acknowledges the shared ability to transform the boundaries between English and Spanish. And lastly, one more quote from page 77. The transformation of mock Spanish into inverted Spanglish quote, reflects an awareness of the racializing forces that position them on the margins of Americanness. So in some cases, hyper-anglicizing Spanish might be a way to display English language abilities, which is a response to the assumption in the United States that Latinx folks or brown folks or bilingual folks do not actually speak correct English or can't speak English that is untainted by Spanish. Well, that's all for today, folks. I know you're wondering about that book giveaway. All you gotta do to win is comment down below. And in seven days, I'm gonna put everybody's name in a drawing and announce the winner on Twitter and Facebook. So be sure to follow. And hey, don't forget to help out with the Patreon account. This is Mike with the Social Life of Language, and we're done.